Hi guys, um, here I am again, and this is our first reading of um, the rest of our novel, The Underground Canada by Barbara Smucker. Um, as you know, we have been reading this novel and we are about three quarters of the way through. So I'm gonna read the rest of the novel and post it in um, the reading section of our website. So they're not gonna be glamorous videos, it's just gonna be me reading. And so feel free to listen and enjoy and you'll be using um, the rest of the reading for this particular novel in completing some of your novel study package things. Um, so yeah, uh, listen, it's reading day one. We're gonna start on chapter 14. We read chapter 14, um, it's on page 95. If you happen to have the book at home, we don't expect that you do because at this time materials that are school owned are not going home. So um, yeah, we have read chapter 14, but I am going to reread it so that we are have a good reminder of where we are at and um, go from there. So chapter 14 on Underground Canada. There wasn't much danger from the slave catchers on the high mountain path that night, but even without them, this wild place was terrifying and strange for Julie Lee and Liza. High-pitched animal cries that they had never heard before echoed in and out of the tall black mountain peaks. Their path sometimes became slim as the string binding of a cotton bale, um, as Liza exclaimed. The girls hauled on to one another, and once Julie Lee had to grab a swaying tree limb to keep from just slipping down the mountain slide. Z L Liza fell against her hanging to her waist. They climbed up again on their hands and knees. If the North Star wasn't up there steady beckoning to us, Julie Lee shuddered, I couldn't go on. Before long, a strange, nervous wind began to blow. It skittered about, twirling up the stones along the path then jumping into the trees and making ugly swaying brushes of the giant pines. A cloud smashed across the moon and erased their path. It was dark now, as dark as the deep end of the cave. The air began to chill. Julie and Liza stopped climbing and held onto the trunk of the nearest tree. The wind lashed around them like a slave owner's whip. Some place nearby there, nearby there was a long crackling noise and then a thud. When the flashes of lightning came, Julie and Liza could see a giant tree torn from the earth with its raw, useless roots exposed to the storm. Thunder pounded in the sky and then rain swept down like moving walls of water. Another flash of lightning. This time the girl saw a flat place close at hand, shielded by an overhanging rock. Get all the tree limbs you can find, Liza, and pile them under the rock. Julie screamed above the wind. The pile grew high. They dragged heavy limbs that could not blow away. Now we'll dig a place under the rocks, Julie Lee screamed again. They scraped and groveled, their hands bled, but a small shelter did take shape, big enough for the two of them to squeeze inside. They shoved their bundle ahead of them. It's dry in here, Liza rubbed her hands over the ground, but their newly patched clothes dripped with water and they chilled each other. They chilled each time the wind blew through their makeshift hovel. There was nothing to do but take their clothes off, wring the water from them as best they could, and hang them over the branches that will dry, that were still dry. They covered themselves with pine needles and branches of dried leaves and dug deep with sticks into the dry earth. They lay down close to each other for warmth. Somehow they slept, and when they woke, the wind had stopped blowing. Mountain birds chirped their early morning songs and a faintly pink sun spread shyly across the sky. The girls peered through their shelter of the branches, fallen limbs and scattered leaves crisscrossed over the ground. Looks like somebody's stirring the whole place up with a big wooden spoon, Julie Lee pushed her head clear of the branches above her. Nobody's gonna come looking for a runaway slave in this mess. Liza shook the still damp clothes and hung them carefully over the limbs of the warm air. The sun rose, it was humid and hot. The damp clothes seemed <clears throat> steamed and then blew stiff and dry. Gratefully, the girls dressed and ate a small amount of food packed for them by the w good women of Felsham. We'd best walk in the daylight, Julie said. There's no paths left and no signs of people. Trying to step over these sticks and stones when nighttime comes is more than my two legs can manage, Liza agreed. They decided to stay near the covering trees at all times and take cover at once if the stir of life was hard, was heard around them. They trudged along whatever trails they could find. Sometimes furry little animals jumped across their path, but the wild beasts that howled in the night seemed to take cover for the day. The girls climbed on and on, only stopping for drinks from the flooded mountain streams. Their guide was the needle of the compass with which led them Julie Lee's hands. The land was getting flatter and flatter and the protective mountain peaks were behind them. That night, they rested uneasily in a cornfield near a road. In the very early morning, Julie Lee saw an old colored man hobbling along the road, pulling a cart behind him. 
She crawled quickly from their hideout and walked up to him. She had no fear of this ancient, white-haired, black-faced man. Can you tell me what town I'm coming next to? She asked. The old man jumped a little. Julie Lee start startled him. It seemed as if he had trudged this road a thousand times and never had a black girl bound out right in front of him before. He stopped his cart and looked at her carefully. Lexington, Kentucky, he answered kindly. Then he whispered, you a slave? You running away? Julie Lee didn't have to answer. The old man knew. He looked cautiously down the road behind him as though expecting someone. Then he pulled his cart to the side of the road and lowered the handles to the ground. He reached inside his loose jacket and drew out half a loaf of bread. This is for you, child, he said softly. His wide old eyes lightened on her briefly and then focused far away with tired patience. If I was a young man, I'd go long, he said. He peered again down the road. Hide in those bushes, boy. When night com comes, follow the railroad tracks to Coving Covington. There's a free color man named Jeb Brown lives there. He'll get you across the Ohio River in his little boat. You've got to cross the Ohio to get to Canada. Julie Lee was startled when she heard Canada. How did the old man know? But she didn't question him. She held his hand instead of and thanked him for from the bottom of her heart. The old man's back was more bent than Liza's, she noticed. His shabby clothes barely covered it. But he had strong arms and steady feet, and he had a, a pleasing look on his face since giving Julie Lee his bread. He started towards his cart when a man on horseback swerved around the corner of the road and stopped beside him. Julie Lee ran quickly to the shelter of the cornfield. The man on horseback pulled in the reins of his horse and gla glared down at the old man. What do you mean, Joe? He cried out, resting by the road so early in the morning. Get along there. He twirled a whip in the air. The old man leaned down and picked up the handles of his cart and plodded on down the road. Julie and Liza held each other and sobbed. He's a slave too, Julie cried. He'll be hungry today. He gave us all his food. She held the bread gently in both her hands. The girls hid far away from the road during the long, hot day. Twice a train passed nearby, clanging its bells and hissing its steam. The little compass always pointed north towards the sound. It wouldn't be hard to find the tracks when night came. They nibbled on the old man's bread and tried some ears of un uncooked corn, but there was no water and the food was hard and dry. Late in the afternoon, some men came walking through the fields. Liza and Julie lay flat on the ground. The men passed them by, walking towards the road and disappeared. They gave me a good fright, Liza. Liza's hands shook as she lifted herself from the ground. I'd say we is, is having more good luck than bad on these days, Julie answered gratefully. Night came early. Four clouds collected overhead and changed the sky into slate gray lid. The girls crept carefully towards the road and discovered that the silver tracks ran right along the side of it. Tonight, it was good that the moon was covered, for there was nothing to hide behind on the tracks. The girls walked on the, on the ties facing the north wind. The tracks cut through fields and forests and it seemed almost that they were silver ropes pulling them on and on towards Canada. Once, during the darkest part of the night, a train roared and chugged and hissed behind them. They stumbled off the tracks into an empty barn as the earth started to shake. There was hardly time for the girls to see the train before it passed, screeching far ahead of them. Julie felt its speed and thought how fast it could take them north, faster than a bird could fly on a horse run. The tracks were their guide on a second light, second night. This time, the North Star shone steadily above them, but Julie Lee and Liza were frightened and ill at ease. It was light as day. Anyone could see them striding along the uncovered tracks. They crept along into the grove of trees, feeling hungry and tired. There had been nothing to eat since they finished the old man's bread. A field of corn waved in the night wind. Its ears hung heavy with grain. We'll start us a fire and roast some of those ears, Julie Lee decided. They were starting to gather dry sticks when a dog came bounding and barking out of the field towards them. They ran for the nearest tree. Julie Lee lifted Liza up into the lowest branch and then swung herself up beside her. The dog circled and barked around the trunk. The girls were tense and their hearts pounded so fast it was hard to breathe. Could this be sniffling old slave catcher's dog, they wondered. Then they heard a sharp whistle. The dog stopped barking and began to whine. Footsteps crunched nearby. What you chasing in that tree, pal? A low-pitched voice asked eagerly. Something for us to eat? Laza and Jalili looked down. It was a black man. Joy and praise the Lord, Jalili cried loud enough for the men to hear. You hush, Julie. Liza grabbed her arm. You trust people too soon. But it was too late to be quiet now. You, you Jeb Brown, Julie asked, calling down to him. The girls were silent. The man hadn't answered. Finally, he said, no, I ain't Jeb Brown. And I don't aim to get mixed up with him. It's a dangerous business he's in. The girls climbed higher into the tree. Don't you be afraid of me, he called to them. There was a long silence. Julie and Liza were still tense and afraid. 
Now listen to me, the man said in a low voice. You come down out of that tree when my dog and me leave. You walk straight ahead through those trees to the north until you hear the running water of the Ohio River. Then you look along the river banks till you see the little house with one candle lighted in the window. That's all I got to say. The man whistled for his dog and together they crunched into the brush and fought and off into the crackling leaves for a cornfield until there was no sound for them to hear. Julie was the first to speak. That man's got no more courage than a mouse, she said. Let's climb down from here now and find the real Jeb Brown. They slid down the tree, with Julie Lee keeping a firm grasp on Liza's hand. It was easy to walk north through the grove of trees and then down a row through a cornfield where the leaves twisted when the wind, wind like hundreds of waves of arms. At the end of the field, they heard the steady splash of moving water. The Ohio River, Liza, Julie whispered. We've reached the Ohio River. They walked towards the sound but stopped abruptly when they saw the flickering light of a single candle from the window of a small log cabin. That's the cabin of Jeb Brown, Lily said, starting, tw starting towards it. Liza pulled her back. You believe everybody, she chided. The man could be telling lies. Julie Lee didn't listen, but dragged Liza with her towards the cabin. When they reached the door, Julie Lee rapped softly. A dog growled inside, then a man's voice came. Who's there? A friend with a friend, Julie Lee used the faithful password. A door cracked open, exposing a big straight man with crinkly gray hair, cold black skin. Beside him growled a large brown dog. You Jeb Brown, Julie Lee asked. You was speaking to the right man, he said, urging them inside. Quiet, pal. He patted the dog's head and then called Ella, who got fright, two packages of dry goods. Oh, sorry, it says Ella, we got freight, two packages of dry goods. A sprightly little brown-skinned woman stood there. Her eyes twinkled above the candle, which she now carried in her hand. Her white hair piled about like fresh-picked cotton. Julie Lee looked quickly around the room. The cabin was orderly and clean. It could have been a cabin in the Freshman. Falchman. Jeb hurried about pulling down shades over all the windows. Ella walked behind a cupboard of dishes, motioning for the girls to follow. She pushed against the wall and it opened like a door. Ella and the girls slipped through followed by Jeb and the wall closed behind them. You stay out of there, pal, Jeb said to his dog. And this time you bark as much as you want if you hear any noises. The room behind the wall was small but cozy. There were mats on the floor and long spread out table with a bench around it. The only window was above them, cut into the roof. Looks like you were expecting us. Julie Lee now felt that she could speak out loud. Liza slumped to the floor, too tired and hungry to walk another step. Poor child, Ella leaned over her. She looked closely at her face and laughed. I thought you two was girls. We've been looking for you since your friends Lester and Adam were here. Lester and Adam? Now you two just rest on those mats. Big, kindly Jeb said, letting himself on one of the benches. I'll explain about everything while Ella fixes some, some supper. There was no way the girls could rest now. They stood in front of Jeb, demanding to know about Lester and Adam at once. Well, they came one night more than a week ago, Jeb said quietly. Chains were hanging from their wrists. They'd rubbed through the skin and both were bleeding. Julie Lee closed her eyes, wondering if she really wanted to know the rest of the story. Lester had a sprained arm. The big man, Adam, had a swollen foot, so sore he could hardly lift it. How'd they know to come here? Julie Lee was awestruck that all of them should come to this lone cabin in Ohio River. They came because we're a station on the Underground Railway, Jeb answered simply. Isn't that why you two came too? Ella interrupted by swinging through the secret door. Her arms held a tray with steaming food. She placed the lit can lighted candle in the center of the long table and around it spread a feast of fresh venison, warm cornbread, wild honey, milk, and butter. They bowed their heads and Jeb prayed. It was a good prayer, full of hope and promise for the end of slavery. Amen, Liza added at the end of with deep emotion. It was so fine being here with colored folks to talk with. Silently, Julie Lee thanked the Lord for this. Now she and Liza could tell their names wi without being afraid. They could talk about the Riley Plantation and Mammy Sally and Liza's preacher father. The white folks who'd helped them along the way were good and kind, but it wasn't the same. Jeb and Ella Brown were like having their own family sitting around. Julie Lee and Liza filled their plates and Jeb told his story. How Lester and Adam had jumped from the slave catcher's wagon during the night they were captured into a swamp, even though they were handcuffed together. For a whole night, they stayed in the water to throw off their scent from the hunting dogs. They rubbed their chains against a jagged rock until it broke and they were free from each other. They drank swamp water and ate watercress. Lester knew names of folks along the Underground Railway, which, had, which he'd pledged to Massa Ross to keep secret, even from the two of them. Those boys were poorly and mighty sick, Ella interrupted. I nursed them for a week in this very room. When they could walk, they left. They told us to watch for the two of you. Julie Lee sat on her mat and cried. She had thought and dreamt of Lester and Adam dragging their heavy chains back to Mississippi. 
Now Jeb said they might be free right now in Canada. Inside, there was a welled up fountain of joy. Tears came from its overflowing. But what's the underground railway? Liza finally asked. You don't know about the railway, Jeb laughed. The slave catchers gave us the name. They said runaway slaves just seem to disappear underground and there must be a railway down there. We abolitionists use the railway all the time, Ella laughed softly. Colored and white folks work together on it. Our homes, where we hide you slaves, are the railway stations. The roads you all follow are the trucks. You runaway slaves are the freight. The women are dry goods and the men are hardware. So that's why Jeb announced them as a package of dry goods when they came to his cabin door. Chilly chuckled to herself. We aim to send you from here to the president of the Underground Railway, L Levi Coffin, said Ella. He's a Quaker and he lives across the river in Cincinnati. That's the end of chapter 14.